හොඳයි එහෙනම් දේශනාව ආරම්භ කරන්න කලින් සිල් දෙනා සාදු කාරය පවත්වන්න පංච ශික්ෂාව සමාදන් වීම සඳහා සිල් දෙනාම තෙවරක් නමස්කාර පාඨයේ සජ්ජායනා කරන්න बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि धम्मं सरनं गच्छामि संघं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियम पी बुद्ध सरण गुतियम पी धम्म सरण गच्छामी दुतियम पी संघं सरण गच्छा तीयम पी बुद्ध सरण गच्छा तथियम पी धम्म सरण गच्छामि तथियम पी संघं सरण गच्छामि सरनागमन संपूर्ण पानाति पातामणी शिखा पद सी अदिन्नादान वैरमणि शिखा पद सी कामेशु मिच्छाचार वैरमणि शिखा पद सी मुसाबाद वैरमणि शिखा पद सी सुरा मेर मज्जपमादाना वैरमणि शिखा पद सी तिशरण साधि पंचशील दम साधुक सुरक्षित खत्वापेन संपादेत
Okay, you may all be seated now. So before we commence today's Dhamma discussion, let us pay homage to the Supreme Buddha, who is the peerless one, the perfect one, the uncomparable one. It is because of him, it is thanks to him, we have the gift of Dhamma. It is thanks to his infinite compassion, his infinite sacrifice for all sentient beings that we have this Dhamma that helps us find refuge and salvation, redemption from this endless torture, endless pain of samsara. So let us all pay refuge to the Lord Buddha before we commence today's sermon. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse <clears throat> okay, so, also before we commence, let us take a moment to invite devas, brahmas, spirits, demons and the dead. Anyone who's been a relation of ours in our past births, throughout this timeless, endless journey in samsara, let us open up our homes to them. May they join us, may they find homage, may they find refuge in the Dhamma. May they be able to witness this meritorious deed and be able to gain merits, acquire merits, accrue merits to be born in the blissful plane if any of them have been born in the woeful plains. And for those who are in the blissful plains, may they be able to receive this gift of Dhamma and find the noble bliss of Nibbana. So as I make this invitation, I request you to Extend that invitation in your hearts and in your minds to all the devas, spirits, demons, and the dead. All your past relations throughout sansara, anyone who's been a parent, a brother, sister, uncle, aunt, or perhaps teachers in your previous births, as well as in this births, if anyone, if anyone has been someone who's been of assistance, help, or support to you, and perhaps are not alive today, invite all of them to join us and listen to this sermon. Samanta Chakvalesu Atantra Gachantu Devata Sadhamam Munirajasansa Sunantu Sagamokadang Dhamma Savana Kalo Ayang Badanta Dhamma Savana Kalo Ayang Badanta Dhamma Savana Kalo Ayang Badanta Also, before we commence, let us take a moment to reflect on the reality and accept the truth that although today we have found refuge in the Dhamma and today our lives have changed beyond recognition, throughout our journey in samsara we have not had the privilege of associating the Dhamma or the noble moral people. Our associations have virtually always, almost always have been with immoral, ignoble people. And in those associations, they filled our minds with Raga, Dvesha, Moha. And then, having been defiled with Raga, Dvesha, Moha and been blinded with Avidya and Tanha, which is ignorance and attachment, we would have abused the Aryas, desecrated them, slandered them, hurt them in various ways, shapes and forms. And today, either knowingly or unknowingly, any abuse we might have directed towards them block our way, hamper our understanding to Nibbana and understanding of the Dhamma. So before we commence, let us all take a moment to seek forgiveness from the Noble Ones 
the Sama Sambuddhas, the Pacheka Buddhas, the Arahatta Buddhas, the Anagami, Sakurdagami, Sotapannas, be they on the path or the fruit. And also, prior to us commencing, let us all take a moment to make a firm resolve that through the course of this sermon, this Dhamma discussion, may we be able to unblock any barriers, may we be able to lock any doors that are perhaps between us and our understanding of Nibbana, and any obstacles that are in the way to us, between us and the attaining of, attainment of Sotapanna, the stage of Sotapanna, let us all make a firm resolve that through the course of this sermon, may, us all, may we all be able to attain the fruit of Sotapanna during the course of this sermon itself. So with that firm resolve in mind, let us all be prepared to listen to this sermon. So, <clears throat> we have a gathering on Skype, and there's also a small gathering here. And I think last time you had some questions that you put forward. I don't have any questions as of today. But what I think we'll do is we'll make a start. I'll, we'll start to discuss the Dhamma. Ultimately, what we need to understand is the anicca dukkha, not the nature of this existence. Why continued existence, continuing this transmigrational process that is birth and death and birth and death or rebirth and death in this sansara is, is really not bringing us anything. It's not getting us closer to anything. Every day is just wasted time. Every waking moment we seem to be doing things that doesn't seem to get us anywhere so let us spend some time to reflect on that and hopefully during the course of that there will be things that will answer some questions that you might have in your minds which perhaps you haven't forwarded or put through to us as yet uh, if there are questions that come up and pop up in your mind then that's also fine you can you can ask them um, so we'll, we'll play it by ear, so to speak. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Okay. Did you guys get to listen to the sermon that we did this afternoon? So, um, you see, compared to some of the things that we seem to do in our normal day-to-day -day existence and this is not just in lay life and you know this is some of some of that stuff happens in in the life of, a, of an ordained person in the, in the life of the clergy if you're not careful I mean the reason that I became a monk and lots of other people go forth they don robes either as monks or nuns is to be careful about how we spend our time I've studied time management uh, like nobody's business. It was a favorite topic of mine when I was a lay person. I, had, I read lots of books on that. I listened to audio tapes, watched videos on time management. And what I learned time and time again, uh, no pun intended, is that with time management, we all have limited time. We all have 24 hours a day. There's, none of us have 24 days and 5 minutes. None of us have 23, or rather 24 hours and 5 minutes, or 23 hours and you know, 1 minute less than the 24. That, that's not how it works. We all have the same time. What we can do is life management more than time management. So in life management, what we've got to decide is what do we choose the time that we have what do we choose to do in the time that we have? That's all we can, we really have a say on. We've all got the same time. So it's what we choose to do with the time that we have. Now, the reason I say this is because, as I said, having become a monk, I have to be always careful of how I spend my time because the reason I made this choice, the reason I let go of all those attachments and perhaps some of the duties and responsibilities that come as a package with being a lay person was so that I could dedicate my life towards fulfilling the path, the Arya Ashtangika Marga. So I have to be extra careful. Now, I don't think it's any different for you guys either. 
you all got to be very careful because just as much as I realize that time is limited, we've all got the same 24 hours. In reality, I think because of the duties, responsibilities that lay on your shoulders, the reality is that you end up doing lots of stuff in your day-to-day -day lives, which sometimes perhaps are not things that you really wanted to do, but you end up doing them anyway. Sometimes they're not things that really bring you happiness or take you towards your goal, but things that sometimes other people expect of you, society expects of you, and normal, the, the, the course of existence, uh, st you know, usual societal decorum expects of you. So you, you happen to engage in things that really steal your time. This is theft. There's no worse theft around. This is the theft of the worst kind. Theft of valuable human life. By life, I mean the time that you have to be alive. Because no one's come and killed any of you as yet. So it's not that life I'm talking of. It's not this bre breathing lungs or the, the beating hearts I'm talking about. I'm talking about the life that you're living. By the way, I've reduced the volume on our side because I can hear a repeat and I can hear myself and my voice is quite annoying, I must, I must admit. So if you do have a question, just post a message and then I'll turn the volume up and, uh, up and then I can, I can take those questions, okay? Um, so, you know, we, we seem to be in the middle of this theft and lo and behold, we seem to be okay with that. Time is being stolen from us and we seem to be okay with that. You know, we get really upset if someone ca came and stole our car keys or your watch or your glasses or your necklace or your phone, your clothes, right? Your car, your kids, your wife. If anyone stole any of those things, then, you know, we seem to be really upset about that. We go mad at that. But really, what's the most precious thing that we have? Indeed. It's this life, these ticking seconds, these ticking minutes, and these ticking hours. People come and steal them all the time, and we seem to be okay. Are you l watching me on, a, on your TV screen right now? So you're looking at the biggest thief in your house right now. Your TV. He's right at home. You've let him in. You've given him a proper place at home. It's nicely, neatly hung on the wall, right? And you dust the bugger every other day. You clean it, you wipe it, you get it serviced, you even give it a warranty. This is the biggest, this is the biggest thief ever in your life. Oh no, actually no, there's another one. Chances are he's in your pocket right now. Chances are you've asked him to keep shush for the next couple of hours, hopefully. Otherwise, we're going to hear him cry in a few minutes' time. So that's the other thief. And this thief, these thieves, they bring you the things that keep you bound to sansara. And you seem to be okay with that. The things that keep us bound to sansara are rupa, shabda, gandha, rasa, sparsha. Sights and sounds and smells and tastes and the tactile sensations that we experience. So these thieves that we have given a great place, uh, you know, in our, in our homes and usually in our living rooms, actually, you know what, in some homes, you've invited the thief and given him space in each of your rooms. There's one in the living room. There's one in the bedroom. There's one in the kid's bedroom. Some people have one in the kitchen, and actually some people have one even in their toilets, so that they can take in while they push out. It's incredible how we let these thieves come into our lives and we seem to be okay with that. But the next door neighbor, he plucks flowers from your tree and that sends you bonkers without your permission.
he picks up a coconut that's fallen on his side of the garden when your tree has an, has an overhang onto his side of the garden and yet it's your tree, so it's your coconut. He takes it, picks it up and you go file a lawsuit against him. But the biggest thief ever is right, you know, sat right in your living room and you seem to be okay with that. You walk around with this guy. Right? Sometimes in the middle of meetings, in the middle of lectures, in the middle of lessons, you pull this bugger out and you're you know, using your fingers to tickle him. Right? Left, right, up, down, and you seem to be okay with that. I mean, you know, this, this relationship that you have with thieves, we've, we've got to understand that it brings us harm no end. Because the more you invite them into your lives, the more you let them come and take over your lives, you're not going to even realize that time's ticking by. They're stealing the most precious things that you have, or the most precious thing that you have, and that is your human life. And sometimes parents, you know, having lost the most precious thing that you have and succumbing to the thieves, you also, what you also do is you give these, you, 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 you duplicate these thieves and you hand them over to your children as well. Here, puta, here, dua. Would you like to make friends with this thief? But you ask them to be extra careful when they go to school about the friends they associate with. You set rules on what time they have to come back home. Be back home by 6 p.m. or else, you say. But as you say that, you hand over this thief and you ask him, take care of that. Think about this. See, the problem's not with the TV, though. The problem's not with the phone. If you, you know, as an arahant, there's a possibility that you could use a television. If you all were to become arahants, there's a possibility that you might use a phone. There's nothing wrong with that. Because we are not a bunch of people who are against the world. We've got no problem with the world. We've got no problem with TVs or the internet or Facebook or Twitter or WhatsApp or anything like that. We've got no problem with them. Because we've got to understand that pointing the finger outwards at the world outside has never really solved any problems as of yet. The problems inside. What we've done is we've doused ourselves with flammable fuel. So flammable fuel, so that could be kerosene, it could be petrol, it could be diesel, whatever flammable fuel you can think of. And you go and touch a fire. Now what's going to happen? It's going it's to burn you up. See, this is why we call raga, it's the fire of raga. The fire of dvesha, the fire of moha. It's a fire. These fires are lit within us. Now, of course, the TV brings to us sights and sounds. Your mobile phone, it brings you sights and sounds. And, uh, and I'm sure in, in a few years' time, it's also going to bring you smells and possibly even tastes. Before long, it's going to bring you touch. You know, all in your pocket. You're going to be able to use your mobile phone and it's going to help you feel certain things. You know, um, it's not going to be long before the fashion industry in introduces uh, uh, the facility for you to be able to feel what the fabric feels like before you make your purchase. That's not, it's not long before that comes along. Technology is moving so rapidly. Why? Because the role and the purpose of technology is to give you relief from suffering. That's the purpose of science. That's what science is here to do. So when you make that purchase online, you've got your card in your hand and you want to type in your, your, your long 16 digit long number before you turn the card around and type your CVC into it and press enter you want to know everything that you can about this object so right now you can only see it of course you can read reviews from other people who've read it who've used it but it's not quite the same like when you get to feel it yourself you can hear it in some cases you know if it's an object that makes some noise then you can listen to it but you're still feeling that anxiety, you're still feeling that frustration, hey, I don't know what it feels like. How many times might you have ordered something online and then, you know, you've returned it because, hey, it didn't quite meet, my ex meet up to my expectations. So we are suffering. This suffering of wanting to know what the world's like. But it's more than that. 
It's the suffering of wanting to fit the world into the model that I have built inside of me. And that's in our minds. We have a model of all the things that we have come to know in our world. We have a model of what our father has to be like, what my mother has to be like. I have got, I've got a model of that, and so have you. This is why when, you know, this is why you expect your, you expect your parents to be home by a certain time, or you expect your parents not to be home by a certain time. All of these are models. You expect your brother to behave in a certain way, your little sister to behave in a certain way. You don't like him, him or her entering, in your, ent entering your bedroom without your invitation. All of these are models. So what happens when the outside world doesn't behave to your expectations, that's when the conflict happens. That's when there's a clash, clash of conflict. Sorry, or rather clash of expectations. What people tend to do is then try to fix the problem outside, thinking that the problem is on the outside. This is where the finger pointing business starts. Hey, don't come into my room without me asking you to. Isn't that right? Ami, don't talk to me like that. Puta, don't talk to me like that. I'm not gonna ask, I'm not gonna say that again. Right? Why? We want the outside world to change because we expect the outside world to keep us happy. So our happiness depends on the outside world behaving to our expectations. Oh, how sad that is. How sad. There are 730 billion people populating this planet. Don't know what channels you watch on TV, but when I used to watch TV, I got myself, you know, I, used, I loved watching TV, particularly movies, so I got myself this box, it was called a Kodi. You plug it into your television, and you can watch television 24-7, you can just continue watching movies one after the other. So, if you're watching TV and you have, I mean, how many channels do they have on TV now? Last, before I ordained, I think there were about 20. It's been almost a year, so there must be at least 260 channels by now. At the rate that new channels seem to keep coming into your, onto your television. So you expect 260 channels to keep you entertained. You expect 730 billion people out there to keep you entertained, to keep you happy. You expect all other four people that you live with at home to keep you happy, if you're the fifth person. So happiness seems to be a factor, or rather, the behaviors of other people seem to be the factor that determines my happiness. Oh, how such a sad state that is. Why do we so readily hand over the keys to our happiness to other people? Letting other people come and steal the most precious thing that we have, that is this happiness. These precious moments that we have alive. They bring us rupa, they bring us shabda, gandha, rasa, sparsha. Not being able to penetrate, not being able to see exactly what's going on on the inside. Not spending time to analyze our own thoughts, how we behave in the face of these rupa, shabda, gandha, rasa, sparsha. We just let any old bugger come and walk all over us. We just let any old Facebook, any old Twitter, any old TV channel come and indulge us, intoxicate us, seduce us in the panchakarma. And that continues to bind us into sansara. The reason this is really sad is because if you remember the last time you went to have a meal at say a restaurant or perhaps when you were at, uh, at a wedding, perhaps a birthday party or Perhaps you've been to a buffet restaurant. Actually, no, buffets you serve yourself, right? Most other restaurants or perhaps a, uh, a wedding or somewhere like that where you're stood in a line and there's a, there's a line of um, waiters who serve you as you walk past with your plates. You know, you stop at every dish and then they serve you. And then each of them serve you. Each of them serves you. You have a plate full, you come back to your table, you sit down, now, they were happy to serve you, but who's got to eat all the food that you've served for yourself? Are they going to come and help you eat it? No, they're only there to serve. You've got to eat it. Well, 
life is very much the same. The world and its wife is ready to serve you with Rupa Vedana, or rather Rupa Shabda Gandharasa Sparsha, to bind you and entangle you, entwine you with this pancha karma. But when the consequences come for that, who's got to suffer? You've got to suffer. I've got to suffer by myself. That's so unfair. I didn't sign up for that. Well, actually, you know what? Actually, I did sign up for that. But I didn't realize that that's what I was signing up for. These are the Asat Purusheos. The Asat Purusheo. Immoral people, ignoble people. Recently, my mother rang me. I was speaking with her and and uh, so she was asking me, how, what have you been up to lately? And I said, well, not much. <laughs> Unlike you, I've not be really been up to much. I've just been at my, at my monastery and going out for sermons when there's a need for it. But the rest of the time, I'm just in my mo at, at the monastery and you know, doing what I always do, which is practicing the Dhamma and hopefully moving myself closer to Nibbana. So really not much. And I said, um, and then she related to me a, uh, she reminded me about this gentleman who I had the, uh, actually it was a good fortune of meeting, and I think I might have shared this story with you once in the past. So this, uh, a, a few months before I ordained, as I had shared, after I had shared my wish to ordain with my parents, they, uh, they sent round a, a consultant psychiatrist to visit me and to, well, what? Consult me, of course. That's what consultants do, they consult. So I've got this consultant sat in front of me who's a con consultant psychiatrist and he's, he's interviewing me. He wants to find out what? What's wrong with me? <laughs> Why? Because I want to ordain. So he wants to find out what the hell's wrong with me. So he's asking me questions. He's interviewing me, hey, you know, explain to me, have you, are you, are you in some kind of uh, mental frustration? It's okay, you can share this with me, you can trust me, he says. <laughs> he says, you know, you don't have to bottle it all up. You know, speak with me, you can open up, I won't, sh I promise you I'm not going to share this with anybody. And he pulls up his notepad, starts to write. So he, we spend three hours chatting, a whole three hours chatting. At the end of that he says, um, I would also like to speak to your wife. So I said, yeah, of course, why not? So he asked me, would you mind leaving the room while I speak with her in private? Of course. So I leave the room and now it's my wife's turn. So she sat down, another page turns on this notepad and he starts writing. Two hours pass by. So I'm in my bedroom, you know, doing what I always do, right? It's the same thing I'm doing right now. And at the end of that he says, right, now I want to speak to the two of you together. So now we are both sat down with him, interview commences again, a third page gets turned over on this notepad and he starts writing again and then we go on for another hour. So I've now spent three hours, two hours and another hour, so a complete six hours with this gentleman, a consultant psychiatrist. And he says, well, thank you for the interview. I'll get back to you in a week's time. Two days later I get a call and he asks me, so when did you say you wanted to ordain? I said, it's going to be in September, later this year. So this was back last year. And he says, son, I'm going to retire in May next year. And when I do, I want to come and ordain at the monastery. <laughs> now, that was the state back in May last year. And ever since then, ever since, the, ever since that interview, I was glad that he used to come along to the sermons that we had, you'll you remember. I've got Venerable Dharna Dasa ne sat, sat next to me, so he'll, he'll bear witness to that. So this gentleman, he came along to all the sermons that Guru Swami Nuhansi used to do as a lay person back then. And he used to visit us from time to time at our home and we continued those chats. And he was preparing himself mentally as well as relieving himself from some of the duties and responsibilities that he had towards society, his wife and his, his only son. 
And then he also used to visit us. Even after we came to Sri Lanka, he used to come and visit us at the monastery. So that relationship continued over, over a period of time. But as of late, I've not seen or heard of him, heard from him rather. And so when my mother rang, she asked me, have you heard from him lately? I said, no, I haven't. And then he, he, she says, well, his wife had a problem with him listening to the Dhamma. And she was getting worried that he was going too fast. She was getting worried that he was going to let go of everything and go and ordain. Because actually he hadn't shared that story with his wife. He had kept it quite private. Just as much as I did. Just as much as you would have done with your friends and, and the likes. You know, these things, you, you've got to be really careful about who you share these stories with. Why? Because this world is full of Asat Purusha. <laughs> Right? Everyone wants to, remember, if you've listened to those sermons, suppliers and consumers. Right? This world is full of suppliers and consumers. All they want is to get the cream out of you. They'll squeeze the cream out of you until they can get no more from you. That's all they're interested in, nothing else. This world is full of Asat Purusha, immoral, ignoble people. Right? Because all they know is happiness through indulgence in sensuality, indulgence in the Panchakame. So, this wife on that occasion had um, changed his mind. So, you know, since he started listening to the sermons, he'd even given up drinking with his friends and going out that much. And, you know, he'd become a much more domesticated man. But all of that changed because, you know, since we came here, he's still back there. He, that association stopped gradually. The, the opportunities that he had was when he came down to Sri Lanka, all of that stopped. Right? Now, remember kids, the reason I'm giving, sharing this story with you is because I want you to reflect on your own lives. I'm not just relating a story for the sake of it. This is not just to entertain you. you know, the, the Dhamma is not to entertain you. The Dhamma is to educate you and to instill wisdom in you. So I want you to all to think about your own lives, about some of the associations that you have. And I remember there was one, so anyway, let me complete this story. So, the, uh, so when my mother was relating the story to me, I asked, uh, I asked her, uh, um, well, you know, I, I dare to, I, 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 I fear to ask this question, but did his wife get him to meet a psychiatrist by any chance? You know, just to make sure something wasn't wrong with him? Uh, she didn't find it that funny, but anyway. Um, at the end of that, because ultimately it was my mother who sent around the psychiatrist to meet me in the first place, so clearly she didn't find that very funny. Um, but at the end of that, you know, it, don't, it, it turned out that you know, he's changed his, his, his ambition of becoming a monk and now he just wants to continue his, his lay life. Now, I've got no problem with that because you know, the Buddha only said Bahujana Hitaya, Bahujana Sukhaya, not Sabba Jana Hitaya, Sabba Jana Sukhaya. You can't change the lives of everybody. You can't change the lives of all. All I can do, all the Dhamma can do, all the Buddha can do is try and influence or try and inspire the lives of many, but not all. The reason you're all here today, either on, through, you know, online or here in person, is because you've had inspiration, either from listening to these sermons or by, you know, through, the, through, through the associations that you have. So that could be your parents, it could be your friends, it could be your siblings. So when my mother last spoke to me and she related that story to me, I, I explained to her, you know, this is what happens when you associate with immoral people, with Asat Purusha. And I said, well, you know, guess what? When I, was, when I had decided to be, become a monk, I also had two Asat Purusha in my life who I used to call Amma and Apache. And she says, how dare you? I said, well, <laughs> I don't mean any disrespect, but that is the truth. You, know, you sent that consultant psychiatrist round not to help me fulfill the, the journey I was on, but you know, you really, to be honest, you, you wanted me to take a different path in life, the path that you all took in life, to find happiness. But when I questioned you, have you found happiness in your life? Unashamedly, you turned around and said, no, son, we haven't. And yet you wanted me to travel the same path. So I'm not happy to live a life like that. 
I'm not happy to make the same mistakes that everyone else did, and neither should you be. Individually, each and every one of us have to take account of our lives, have to be responsible for our lives. Yes, our parents are there to help us. Teachers are there to guide us. The Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha is there to guide us, to, to help you navigate the obstacles of life. But ultimately, you have to take responsibility, each and every one of you. You've got to be able to point a finger at, your, at yourself and go, ultimately, I am responsible for how I conduct my life. Anyone here in any doubt that you're going to die one day? Anyone? No. So when you're on that deathbed, and it's question time, and then Mara comes and asks you, or oh, the, the Dharma Adhikarane, which is the... Uh, the court of Dhamma. When the court of Dhamma comes and questions you, what have you done for yourself? You can't at that point start pointing your fingers at your parents, hey, I've done a lot of good for them, I've done a lot of good for them. In fact, the things I did in my, in my life was because he said I should do this, she said, she said I should do this. The he said, she said nonsense is not going to cut it then. It's going to be what have you done for yourself? Because this world is full of suppliers and consumers. You all have to be responsible, each and every one of you, for how you conduct your life, how you live your life. 24 hours we all have. None of us have more than that. None of us have any less than that. They've got the same time left, but they've decided to do something entirely different with that. Right? So, we've got to be careful. So it's life management that really we have to do. So in the time that you all have, and we don't know when this time is going to expire, you know, you have to go to school, you have to do your homework, you have to do the household chores, right? You have to do all of those, all of those things. You can't, you know, speak to your mother and go, Mom, I want to attain Nibbana, so I just want to be in my bedroom, listen to Bana all day long. You know, I can't wash my clothes, I can't wash my dishes, I can't sweep the house. You go and sort all of that out. No, that's not right. That's, that's absolutely wrong. That's the wrong thing to do. Attaining Nibbana is not something you do by going and locking yourself inside a room. Attaining Nibbana is something that you do. It's a practical thing. Once you've listened to the Dhamma and you've found the Dhamma, you've, you've, in, you've installed this Dhamma teacher within your minds, from that point forward, your life is your lab going to school on your commute to work, sitting down in the classroom, watching a movie, listening to a song. These are the opportunities in life that you get to practice the Dhamma that you've learned. You've got to practice what you've learned. It's the practice that's going to remove the fetters, cleanse your mind of the cankers. That's what you've got to do. So make sure that you take responsibility of your life. If there's nothing else you take from today's sermon, take that. Take responsibility for your own lives because when that last day comes, you're going to have to eat by yourself. The whole world and its donkey would have come round. The whole world and its wife would have come round and served your plate. All kinds of dishes. Rupa dishes, Shabda dishes, Gandha dishes, Rasa dishes and Pottabha dishes. Right? All kinds of different varieties of food onto your plate. But when it's time to eat, it's time to eat and it's time to eat alone. If you break a limb, can your best friend come and say, hey, you know, you're my best friend. I realize that you're suffering. Let me suffer half the time for you and you suffer the rest of the time. Ever heard of a best friend come up and say that? What about your parents? Can they come up to you? Or what about your children? Can they come up to you and say, Ammi, all your life you dedicated to me. All your blood that you shed the tears that you shed, the sweat that you shed, you did that for me. Today, you're suffering from a headache. Let me take half of that. No, actually, I'll take three quarters of that. You just keep the one quarter. Anyone heard of a child do that with their parents? No, because that's not possible. Because the karmas we've done, the consequences, we have to suffer by ourselves. So take responsibility. Take accountability. Because when it's time to suffer, you've got to do it by yourself.
no one else atta deepa viharata okay so if you have questions can please you can post them now if we talk about practical life because you know you're all living practical lives you have the lives that you you know you, you go to school you have to associate with friends well i not necessarily have to but you know chances are you want to okay and you have colleagues that you have to you associate with you have neighbors relations and what i think one of the problems that you might be facing by this point because you've probably been listening to sermons for some time is that your perspective on life has changed quite a bit you don't enjoy the same things that you used to but your friends are not quite the same your friends still enjoy indulgence in sensuality your neighbors your relations they still enjoy indulgence in sensuality the guy sits that sits next to you in class he pro he or she still probably endo- enjoys indulgence in sensuality your colleagues still do and so they invite you they encourage you to continue that they ask you to come over for the, for that party every weekend it's party time every friday night let's go out to the pub let's enjoy ourselves that's what life's for what's a worth what's a life worth living if you can't enjoy it while you're alive all of these are thieves thieves that have come into your lives to steal precious seconds actually they don't know that they're stealing their own time as well something that i mentioned at the at the sermon earlier on today and i'll i'll, I'll mention it for your benefit as well the time that we've you see having been born human was not something simple it was an extremely difficult and arduous thing to do to have been born human every moment that you are alive that your heart's beating that your lungs are breathing is time that you've earned for yourself it's not a free gift you've earned it you've earned it through hard work you know think about the money that you've earned when you spend it you think carefully about how you spend your money right why because it's money that you've earned you understand how much sweat blood and tears you shed to earn that money therefore you're very careful about how you spend your money how you invest your money you'd hate for someone to come and steal that money or trick you into spending money on unnecessary things you would hate that wouldn't you but what about your precious life do you think it's been harder to earn 100 dollars or to earn 1 second of human life do you th- which one do you think is harder Which one of these do you think is harder to have earned a thousand dollars or one second of human life Okay well how about this a trillion dollars or one second of human life which do you think is harder to have earned one second of human life But how many precious valuable seconds do you spend do you dedicate every day to preserve and protect a hundred dollar bill a thousand dollars how many of your precious seconds do you dedicate to protect and preserve a tv screen a sofa a house a car i mean you don't think twice before you take the car to the garage some people enjoy washing their cars hoovering on the inside and outside and then washing and wiping and polishing some people i mean that's sensual indulgence for them that is kame sumichachara that's how much they enjoy that all the while you're protect your you're spending this time precious valuable human life to protect and preserve something so material just a load of metal a load of plastic a load of rubber a load of, a bit of cloth i mean what is a car if not all of that a few wires a few buttons right a few indicators couple of pedals that's what a car is you're more than willing to spend valuable precious human life to protect and preserve something so material something that can be taken away from you in the flash of a second or oh, that's all it takes how long does it take for a car to be to be crashed in an accident a second all it takes is one one tanker to fall over your car and that's it 
That's the end of it. One earthquake. Hailstorms. Doesn't take, doesn't take a lot. You're driving past on the highway and a kangaroo jumps in front. That's all it takes. And then you're weeping over it, you're lamenting over it, and then you're more than happy to take time off work and take your car to the garage and spend weeks, if not months, sitting there waiting for that bit of metal to be repaired, all the while spending precious human life, precious human seconds, precious human seconds that you went through so much to earn. Like I said earlier on this afternoon, if you remember, one second of human life, you would have spent at least 50 eons to have earned. One second. And you know how much an eon is. I think we've discussed that in the past. An eon is not a short period of time. I mean, it's, it's, it's so huge. It's so long that the, even the Buddha couldn't give a number to it. He had to use a simile to explain, to illustrate how long an eon was. But we seem to have forgotten the value of that. When do parents ever, ever teach their children, son, daughter, put dua puta, make sure you use this time to attain a margapala? I mean, in your case, that may be the, that may be the case because you know, your parents listen to the Dhamma and they have begun to understand the value of the Dhamma. They've begun to understand the value of precious human life. But think about your friends, think about your best friend at school. You know, day in, day out, they just go through the system. Just playing by the rules of the game, a game that they didn't, they didn't design for themselves. No one asked you, would you like to go to school? And is that how you'd like to make a living? Is education the way that you'd like to make your life successful? Did anyone ask you that? No, but isn't that what you've had to do now, all this time? That's what we've had to do. A game that we are playing, and no one asked me if that's how you'd like to play the game. So we don't stop to question, we don't stop to ponder, we don't stop to think about the consequences. Is there another way to do this? When we don't stop to question ourselves about these things, you know, we fall into the sorry states of cats and dogs and birds and bees and animals, four-legged beings. Because that's what they go through. They don't stop to question. They just work through instinct. Instinct says, you're hungry, go find something to eat. And then you go, and the animal goes to find something to eat. Instinct says, hey, you're tired, go get some sleep. And then the animal just goes and gets some sleep. Instinct says, it's time to mate. And then they go find a partner and starts mating. Well, think for a moment about, have your lives been much different to that? Yes, we've been through education, we've, we are doing, we're doing jobs, we're earning money, we're saving that money, we're going through, you know, we go through economics and you study the world, you study sciences and technology and you go through all of that, but ultimately all of that is to help you do the same things that animals do, but to a better, in a better way. Ultimately, none of that really matters for anything, none of that really accounts for anything, because all of that you're going to leave behind. Again, earlier on today, I gave you this equation, right? X equals something equals Y. Pick any number you like. Pick the number 10. X equals 10, Y equals 10, X equals something equals Y. If something is where you do something to that number, you go through some kind of mathematical formula, what's the result and value of that, of that process? Zero. Well, if you, if you put x into the equation and to get x back out again, or 10 into the equation and to get 10 back out again, whatever you've done in the middle should account to zero. It can't account to 1 because then you're going to get back 11. It can't account to minus 1 because then you're going to get back 9. So it has to account to zero. It has to add up to zero, nil. If we've come into this world with nothing and we leave this world with nothing, None of us came into this world with the clothes that you're, you're wearing right now. None of us came into this world with the jewelry that you've adorned yourself with right now. Or the money that you have in your bank account right now. Or the cars or the children that you have right now. You didn't come into this world with any of that. Well, guess what you're going to leave this world with? Which of the things that you own and possess right now that you love so dearly you're going to leave this world with? Come on, give me a list. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. 
nothing. So if you come in with nothing and you're leaving with nothing, well, guess what you've been doing in the middle of that? Gone. What does that all that account to? Nothing. I lived a life doing nothing. My grandparents lived a life doing nothing. I hope you get the meaning of what I'm trying to say here. You know, yes, you did something. You know, you went to school, you earned money, you, you built houses, you had kids and you went abroad and you traveled the world. You know, you ate 10 course meals and you went to the finest restaurants and bought the nicest cars and drove sports cars and climbed rocks and you've done all that sort of stuff. But what does that all account to in the end? Nothing. So you really got to question, what have I been spending my precious human seconds doing? If, if, if it accounts for nothing. The reason that we've been doing nothing is because that's what the people that we associated with told us to do. The immoral people, the ignoble people, the Asad Purusha, they never got us to think about the purpose of life. I mean, yes, there are books about the purpose of life. I've read virtually all of them. I've read almost all, every book there is about how to live a successful life, how to make money, how to get rich quick. Right? I've, I've gone through all of that. And all of them said, work hard and then you're going to be happy. No pain, no gain. Did you get a chance to listen to that sermon? Did you get a chance to listen to that sermon? No pain, no gain? Yes or no? I'm seeing some empty faces. Okay, I'll take that as a no then. No pain, no gain. What does that mean? If you want to gain something, you have to go through the pain. This house wasn't built by doing nothing. Work had to be done. You had to go through the pain to gain this. The money that you have in your account today wasn't, didn't just appear in your account out of thin air. You had to go through something, you had to go through the pain to gain that. You know, having kids, getting married, all that, you had to go through the pain to gain it. Right? But that's what the world told you to do. That's what society wanted you to do and asked you and said, you know, this is how you can be happy. You have to go through the pain and then if you do so, you'll, you'll reap the rewards. You'll enjoy the, you'll in, you'll enjoy the gain. The Buddha comes into this world and he gives us new interpretation to this no pain, no gain phenomenon. He gives us new interpretation. He says, no, he doesn't say that's not true. He gives new meaning to it. He says, in order to enjoy the pain, sorry, in order to enjoy the, the gain, you've got to realize, you've got to think back and reflect, hey, have I not been in pain beforehand? Same words, entirely different meaning. They are worlds apart. One guy comes and says, if you want to enjoy, go through pain. The other guy comes and says, hey, do you realize that the, that the reason you're gaining right now, the reason that you're happy right now was because you were in pain beforehand? Different perspective. That's what the Buddha comes and teaches, teaches us. And this is what we call ashwada, pleasure. See, I'm trying, I'm trying to summarize Nibbana for you. You know, you, you, could, you could summarize it and take it onto your palm. Because Nibbana isn't something complicated. Life is complicated. Think about all the things you have to do in life. You've got to learn how to brush your teeth. You've got to learn how to brush your hair, how to tie your hair, how to tie your shoelaces, how to cook. And not just, you know, you can't just learn to cook and that'll be it. Well, you have to learn how to cook rice, which is different to how you cook noodles, which is different to how you cook macaroni, which is different to how you cook paripu, which is different to how you cook mallung, which is, cook, which is different to how you uh, cook your sausages. All of those things are different. One is different from the other. And for as long as you're thinking and you're in this perception that happiness is in having that variety, happiness is in the food that I get to eat, well, you're going to, you're going to have no hesitation in exerting yourself 
to acquiring the things that you desire. That's how we've been looking for happiness all along. You've been, you've not hesitated one moment to go through the pain to gain. Because that's all, that, that's the only way we've known to find happiness. Because that's how the Asad Purusha has said, hey, here's how you find happiness. All the books that I read said the same thing. Go through the pain. It's okay. Bear it. Bite your tongue if you must. If you must. Bear the pain. It's okay because there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel. That's what they said. <laughs> so I went looking for that light at the end of the tunnel. What the Buddha says is, to see the light, you have to have gone through a tunnel in the first place. A tunnel is where there's darkness. You have to have had darkness in the first place for you to now experience the light. Well, none of us enjoy the darkness. None of us enjoy the experience of going through the tunnels. We like the light, but to get to the light you have to have enjoyed, you have to have experienced the darkness. So the Lord Buddha points out, he says, this ashwada that we enjoy, this, the, this pleasure that we experience, is always relief from suffering. Relief from the mental torment, relief from mental torture and frustration. And so he asks us the question, is it worth it? Think about all the times that you, find you found happiness in life. You know, from simple things like, you know, uh, from simple things like passing an exam or getting married to the one you, liked, you loved, having a child, building a house, getting yourself a job. You know, each of these things, you would be able to look back into your lives and say, hey, that, those instances, they made me happy. Yes, how do you know the things that made you happy? Go look at your photo albums. Those were the times that you were happy because you took pictures. Just to remind yourself that life is worth living. When the vicissitudes of life come your way, when the problems in life come your way, you sit down, you open up your photo albums and you turn the pages and go, hey, you know what? Although I'm sad right now, life's still worth living. Look at these times when we were so happy. Look at these times when we went to Singapore and we had a, such a fantastic time. Life is worth living. Ha! Ah, I'm glad that I'm still alive. Close the photo album, life continues. Well, thank God we have photo albums. If not for those, if not for those things, you know, I think you know, most of us would be Arahatun Mohanses by now. You know, whenever we're feeling frustrated, we go looking for happiness. We go for looking for relief from, from suffering. Quite honestly, why do we keep these photo albums? And by the way, I'm not saying throw all them out or burn them, right? Please don't do that. That's not what I'm saying. I just want you to think. I want you to be intelligent about why do we, why do we cling on to those rupas that we've seen in the past. I mean, think about this. Why do we take so many pictures when we go places. I mean, if all you want is a, is, a, is, a, is a memoir, an aid memoir, that all of your family have been somewhere, then you take one picture, ask a, ask a bystander, ask a passerby, hey, mister, would you mind just taking a picture of us? And you stand by this, this monument, and you take, your, you take a picture, that goes into your photo album, that really should be enough, right? Why do you have to go through an entire album of pictures for that one trip that you made? Why? We should really, you know, really, we should question these things. Why do we do the things that we do? You know, this is valuable time that you spent clicking that camera. Valuable time you stood posing in front of, you know, those selfies that you took, posing in front of those monuments and those waterfalls and those fountains, right? Taking selfies of yourself with your selfie stick. That's valuable time that you spent. Did not stop to question why I took these pictures. And half the time, actually, you, know, you don't even go back and look at them. All that happens is you come online, they go posted on Facebook, and that's the, that's the end of it. All, the only reason you come back again, back online, is to check what comments have been posted from your friends. What do your friends think about that top that you wore? Or that hat that you had on your head? That's what that's for. 
Half the time, we don't even flick through those albums ever again after they've been posted. You know, we want the world to appreciate us. We want society to appreciate us. Why? We want society to give us value. Why so? Because that's where we've always found value. The really sad and sorry state of life is that the worth that we've given to ourselves is the worth that people give us, other people give us. If I, were, if I ask you right now, how much do you value yourself? Chances are, you're going to think of the five people that you associate the most with and you're going to give me the total sum of, or the average of how much they value you. You're going to say, um, I'm valuable because why? I'm a mother. A mother to whom? Your children. So it's the value that your children give you. I ask you, who are you? And you say, I mean, let's be honest, I ask you, who are you? What are you going to say? I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I'm a husband, I'm a wife. To whom? To somebody else. Your value, your worth is defined by, by what somebody else thinks of you. By what somebody else feels about you. So what happens the day when the day comes when you become worthless to other people? Why do you think people go and commit suicide? Why do you think people go and hang themselves? Or jump in front of trains? Or jump from bridges and commit suicide? when society stops giving them value. When their boyfriends stop giving them value. When their girlfriends stop giving them value. When their husbands and wives stop giving them value. Then they feel worthless because they've forgotten why they came into this world in the first place. They've forgotten how hard I've struggled to earn this human life. Having forgotten that the value that, they've, that they that they give to themselves is now dependent on what everyone else thinks about them. What my workers think about me. I mean, you know, think people, people, get in, people, people are stressed at work. Life, people are stressed. You know, stress is a big problem these days, right? Everyone everywhere is just so stressed out. What is stress? Stress is nothing but deterioration of value you've given to yourself as a result of what other people think about you. That is what stress is. Stress is something that you experience because you're now exerting yourself to fulfill expectations that other people have set on you. That is what stress is. When was the last time you were stressed because you couldn't brush your teeth? <laughs> Anyone got stressed because they couldn't brush their teeth? No. Anyone got stressed because they couldn't brush their hair? No. Why were you stressed? Because you couldn't do your homework on time. Because you couldn't complete your chores on time. Because you couldn't complete that report on time. Because you couldn't complete uh, that work engagement or complete that appointment. Complete a hundred units of sales on time. That's why you were stressed. Who asked you to do them? Indeed, society, everybody else. So when you're unable to fulfill those expectations, now you start fearing, now you start worrying. Hey, what are, how are they going to value me now? People aren't going to say good things about me. Now people are going to start finding fault in me and with finding fault, my value is going to start deteriorating. It's going to start diminishing. And when that happens, who's going to give me value? You know, you ask, ask guys, some, you know, some people who get addicted to drugs or alcohol, right, who's, who's tried to find uh, refuge in, in, in intoxicants. Most of the time you go and ask them, why did you get into this? And people say, well, it's because, you know, my, I didn't feel loved at home. I didn't feel like people cared, cared about me. My wife didn't, doesn't speak with me. My husband didn't, doesn't, doesn't look at me. You know, he, he doesn't find, he, he, he doesn't enjoy my association. My children don't care for me. So now I've got to go and find ways to enjoy myself. So the value that they had, the value that they thought that they had, has now started to diminish. Why? Because their value was determined by the society, the people that they associated with. And that is such a shame. But go speak to an Arahatun Nuhanse and ask them, 
what do you value yourself? Now he's going to say zero. But that's not because he doesn't feel loved by you all. That's not because he doesn't feel cared for by us all. That's for an entirely different reason. But ever seen an arahatun nuhan say, go commit suicide? Through frustration? Ever seen an arahatun nuhan say, go jump off a cliff? No. Yes, they do something called letting go of the... Um, I can't remember the English term for it now. Ayu Sanskara. It will come to me in a moment. They do something like that where they, they, they make a resolve, they determine, I, I want my life to end after a certain state. You know, even the Buddha did that. Three months before he passed away, he resolved, my life must end in three months' time. But that's not through frustration. You see, the reason I'm, I'm addressing this is because I understand that there are a lot of young listeners here. And these are problems that you're going to experience in, in life as young people. You know, the life, life is going to go, all, life is going to throw all sorts of problems at you. People, you know, you're going you're gonna to start to define who you are based on what other people start to say about you. You know, you're going to be the resultant of the totality or the average of what your five best friends think of you. The average of what the five best people, the five closest people that you associate think you have to dress, that's how you're going to dress. The average of the five people that you're going your closest, you're, you're going to have your closest associations with. And I'm not talking about family. I'm talking about people outside of family. The five people, and, and you know, think about this. Think for a moment if your life experiences, experience agrees with what I'm saying or it does not agree with what I'm saying. The way you brush your hair, the way you walk, the way you dress, where you sit in the class, whether that's at the front of the class, so you can pay attention to the lessons, or you sit right at the back of your class. Who determines that? Chances are, it's the five people that you, clo you most closely associate you with. They're going to say, hey, let's sit at the back, so we can get up to all kinds of mischief, and the teacher's not going to know about it. Or, you're going to be associating with Satpurusha, in a worldly sense, and they're going to say, you know what, mate, we've come into class to get the most out of school. Let's not waste our time. Let's not wait, uh, waste our mother's, our parents' money and, and their time. Let's go sit in front of the class. Let's get the most of the time that we spent here. Oh, okay, you know what, I think you're right. Let's do that. So you have to be very careful about the people that you associate. I think this sermon to, should be titled Satpurusha and Asatpurusha. That is, this is what I'm talking to you about. Because as young people, you're going to come across both kinds of people. People who are going to encourage you to engage in unmeritorious deeds. And first, they're going to, they're going to instill value within you. They're going to say, hey, you know, you're a good guy. We like you. You see, this is the problem with giving value to yourself based on what other people think about you. When your friends that you associate with or you're attracted to the people that give you value by saying all sorts of things. Machang, you're a great guy, right? Come on, dude, let's hang out together. Hey, I think, you know, you're a really cool guy. Let's go out. Let's go get a drink. And the allure is so strong. The seduction is so strong, so you feel like going along with them. And then slowly but gradually, your self-worth is going to be dependent on what they think about you. And now the way you conduct yourself is going to be shaped by, why, by what they say, by what they think. And slowly but gradually they're going to say, hey, you know what, you're a cool guy. And what do all cool guys do? They do drugs. You're a really cool guy. And what do all cool guys do? Indeed, they smoke. They take drinks. Just a little bit, not much. There are more young monks in our monastery than the fingers on my hand who'd taken drugs. <laughs> You're not a monk yet. I'm speaking of monks, young novice monks in our monastery. More of them than the fingers on my hands who've taken drugs, who've done alcohol, smoked played truant, 
missed lessons, wasted their parents' money. Parents think they've been going, going along to tuition classes. But no, they had other plans. Some of them patronized brothel houses. Their parents don't know. This is the sorry state that we live in. Recently one of them came out to me and he was he was with me while you know while I was doing something and I said, you know, I like to talk to you guys because I, I share the stories that you share with me with when I do sermons. And they're perfectly fine with that because they understand where they were, the plight that they were in. And they want they want me and through this Dhamma to save young people like yourselves from falling into that trap. Because all of this, you're responsible ultimately. But it's the people that you choose to associate that get you into this place. Why? Everyone's prepared to serve, but who's got to eat? You. Some even ended up in prison. You didn't know that, did you? No. And their parents didn't know that either. One monk who's only, he was in grade six, when he left home and came to ordain as a monk. And he tells me when he was at school, he, there was a sports meet. This was a mixed school. So I don't know if you guys know in Canada, in Sri Lanka, we have mixed schools where you have guys and both girls and boys, they go to the same schools, right? So they're called mixed schools. And so this this uh, this child who was only in he was only in grade he was he was just finishing grade five moving on to grade six so they had their sports meet and at the sports meet there were obviously other guys who came from other schools and his best friend from came around from another school and so they get they got to uh, speak with each other of course while you know while they're in the middle of the sports meet and the guy says to him. Majang, you know, my girlfriend's here today as well. Shall we go and try out? Shall we have some fun? This is a guy in grade five. Shall we go have fun? So the three of them, they walk into the toilets. Believe you me, they have done everything that you can do including stuff that is usually done after marriage. Grade five. Today he's ordained with us. Thankfully now he has a better future. I'm not saying come all and ordain. Come all ye and ordain. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying though is be careful about who you associate. Be, I mean I don't know how much you're willing to do this. I don't know how much you're prepared to do this. But this world is so cruel. Be as open and honest as you can with your parents. I couldn't give you a better advice than that. Be as open and honest as you can. They're the only ones that are going to save you. At least they're going to make an attempt to save you. The Dhamma is the only thing that can save you. Your parents can't save you. Let me reiterate that. Let me just be perfectly clear. Your parents can't save you. The Buddha couldn't save you. It's only the Dhamma that can save you. But at least if you open up with your parents, they'll take the time to sit down with you, go through whatever problems you've experienced, whatever experiences you've had, and they'll talk to you. And then they'll give you, they'll give you lessons through the Dhamma. You know, when I was growing up, I feared sometimes to go and speak to my parents. Fear of being hit, spanked, shouted at, yelled at, screamed at, or locked in a, in a basement. I feared that. But I doubt parents who listen to this Dhamma would resort to that sort of treatment. I, I doubt that parents who listen to this Dhamma would resort to that kind of rehabilitation because that is not rehabilitation of any sort. 
I urge parents who are listening to this sermon, make sure that your children are able to come and open up to you. Always encourage them to come and open up to you. Speak to them every day. Puta, Dua, what did you do at school today? It's okay. You know, remember what Swami Nwaza said at the sermon that day. I'm not going to shout at you because that's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do me any good either. Because if I shout at you right now, next day you're not going to come and tell me when something goes wrong. I don't want to make that mistake. I don't want to take a risk with your life because I brought you into this world to keep you happy. If I shout at you, if I hit you, then chances are you're not going to come and tell me the next time something happens at school. I mean, look at that poor kid. He went through all that and his parents, they, know, they don't know any better. They're none the wiser. Their parents don't know any of this stuff. Now, I, I, I get the opportunity sometimes to speak to their parents and they think, this is a child from the heavens. They think this is a bodhisattva. But little do they know what he's gone through, what he's been through. He, he, he's, he's, he, he made me promise that I wouldn't share this with you know, anyone that could personally identify him by relating his story. But I asked him, you know, would you mind if I shared this story? And he said, yes, that's fine. And then there was another monk who came and listed 10 different drugs that he'd, he'd done. In grade 9 he was. 10 different uh, drugs. And he said, some you just leave on your lower lip, some you put into your cheek, some you put up your nostril, some you put into your ear. I don't know what other orifices you can stick drugs in. But he'd done every single thing he could do. Injections. And I asked him, how did you get into that? Friends, he said. Just one word. Friends. You call them friends? This is the society we live in. Don't know if you remember, last time we had the sermon here, I asked you, what is your most prized possession? Yes, it's your human life, but leave that to one side for a moment. Is it this house? Is it your car? Is it your jewelry? It's your children, right? If you forget human life for a moment, put that to a side. Your most prized possession are your kids. But guess what? You've taken out an insurance plan for your house. You've taken out an insurance plan for your car, for the jewelry that you lock in a cupboard. Some even have insurance plans for their shoes. What about the most prized possession that you have? What insurance plan did you take out for them? I'm not talking about life insurance. I'm not talking about, well, yes, Swami so Nuhansa, when I die, my kids are going to get a, uh, they're going to get a windfall. That's not the insurance I'm talking about. I'm talking about how have you guaranteed that they're not going to collapse, that they're not going to fall apart as soon as you let them out into society? Have you taught them how to identify good people from bad people? Have you taught them how to identify noble people from ignoble people? Morality from immorality? Have you taught them how to do that? Or, 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 or is your association with them a constant teaching of here's how you earn money, here's how you grow rich, here's how you build properties? Is that all you teach your children? By the way, I'm not just pointing fingers at parents. Kids, you've got to be careful because ultimately you've got to take responsibility. When it's time for you to say goodbye, you can't point your finger at your mother and go, well, she never taught me that I had to be careful. Leave me, take her. <laughs> That's not going to work. When Mara comes and it's time to drag you to the hell, you can't say, can, you, can I sub my mother? Time out? No, that doesn't work. It's time for you to pay. You've got to eat by yourself. One monk who was only in grade 8 when he left lay life to, to come and ordain, he tells me, I'm so glad that I'm ordained today. Had it not been for that, 
I would have been a father by now. He's only in grade eight. Apparently, a few weeks later, the deed was going to happen. And I think you know what I'm talking about. And I asked him, why? Friends, he said. Hmm. Friends. Now, children, I want you to think about the friends you associate with. I want you to think about the people that you, you get along with at school. The people you meet on the streets. The people that you, you sit next to in class. You know, as I said, the five people that you most associate with, chances are they'll define what you're like. If you were to take all the attributes of the five people that you most closely associate with and get the average of that, chances are you are, you are that. That is you. They are all the attributes, good and the bad, of the five people that you most closely associate with. I'm talking about outside your family. Because outside home, you live a different life. You know, you're not, you're not as, you know, you, you're not the, uh, you're not the son, you're not the daughter that you're at home when you go outside. You know, I think we all know that. You're an entirely different person when you leave home, right? Let's not kid ourselves. How do I know? I, well, I used to be the same, right? My mom thought I was something and I was something entirely different outside. So chances are, you know, that's going to be the case for all of us. So what I'm trying to help you with here is how do you, when you don't have your parents by your side to look after you, to guide you, how do you make sure that your associations are the right ones? Here's the formula. Sabba papa akarna. The Buddha's message is timeless. Every situation, apply the Buddha's teaching and you can't go wrong. Every time I went wrong in my life was because I did something that he said don't do. Every time I went wrong in my life was because I did something that he said abstain from, refrain from, and I went ahead and did it anyway. Guess who's, who had to suffer? Sabba papa sakarana. Abstain from all unmeritorious deeds. Pranagata, taking the life of anything, any living being. It doesn't matter what size they are, big or small. Someone says, hey, there's, a, you know, there's some ants over there. What pesky little insects they are. Just kill the buggers. Walk away. Let that be somebody else's problem. Because who's going to have to suffer? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Who's going to have to suffer? You know, some guy says, you know, get yourself a spray, a bagon spray. Zap them up. It only takes a few seconds. You know, it's easy for them to say, yes, it's easy for you to do. Why? Because science helps us relieve, thanks to science, we can quite easily and quite quickly relieve ourselves from suffering. But what science doesn't help us do is redeem ourselves from suffering. And actually, what has science helped us do on this occasion? Put us further into the pit of suffering. When you didn't have the zap, you had to kill them one by one. Now, it's just choose. That's it. A whole colony of ants in one go. That's it. How simple that was. But each and every life you've taken is a pranagata. Each and every life you've taken, you're going to have to suffer the consequences for. Remember Kalani Maharaj Anwahansi? I've shared the story on sermons in the past. There was a Rahat Anwahansi whose name was Kalani. His name was Kalani. Kalani Maharat Anwahansi. And he, his death was in a cauldron of hot oil. Hot, bubbling oil. That's how he had to die. Someone put him into it. That was a punishment that was given to him. M well, because he'd committed, an un uh, he'd committed a deed prior to him becoming an Arhatun Nuhansi. And then later having been caught, caught and then uh, it was time for punishment. 
the king at the time, he didn't realize that this was an arahatun muhansi by that time. But, you know, justice has to be served. So you did the deed, now you've got to suffer. He didn't realize that this was an arahatun muhansi, I, I'm now going to punish. Had he known, do you think he would have done it? <laughs> Killing an arahatun muhansi? Even if that person had killed your mother before becoming arahatun muhansi? Now you know the Dhamma. Answer this question. A man comes on, comes on, he kills your mother, he kills your father. You go looking for this guy and you find him eventually a week later. Now he's an Arahatun Muhanse. What's the next thing you do? What's the next thing you do? Here are a few options. Take a stick and beat the hell out of him. Here's option two. Take a knife and chop his head off because he's killed both your parents. Here's the third option. Walk away. Here's the fourth option. Worship him like you've never worshipped in your life. Which option do you pick? The fourth, of course. What happens if you pick the first or the second? Oh, big mistake. All he did was kill somebody else's mother, somebody else's father. Yes, he's going to have to suffer, but not in the avitya. You kill that Arhatun Mahanse, what have you just done? Committed a heinous crime. Now where do you think you're going to end up suffering for that? In the avitya. Walk away and you've missed an opportunity. What for? To be born many countless times in the Deva worlds. To be born many countless times in the Brahma worlds. And perhaps, hopefully, to, to, to acquire merit, that's going to help you attain Nibbana. That's what happens. That's the opportunity you've missed if you pick the third option, which is walking away. But pick the fourth option. Treat him as best you can. Bring arms and offer him. Worship him. Wash his robes. This man who killed your parents. But can you bring yourself up to behave like that? This is the question that you need to ask yourself. If ever you really find yourself in that situation, can you bring yourself up to do that? How would you really feel at that time? Or is ignorance going to cloud your judgment? Is the pain and the, and the grief that you're in, the sorrow that you're in, going to, go, going to come and cloud your judgment? And then you pick up a knife and cut his head off big mistake probably the worst mistake you've done in a long time in sansara so the same goes with your parents I don't know if you remember last time I was here I reminded you all think not of your parents as a mother or a father think of your parents as Arahatun Muhanses you live at home with Arahatun Muhanses why? Because the Buddha equaled your parents. For each one of us, our parents. Not somebody else's parents, but our parents. He put them on the same level as Arahatun Muhanseis. You kill an Arahatun Muhanse, it's time to pay in the Avitya. You kill your mother, you kill your father, it's time to pay in the Avitya. So if that's how bad it is to be disrespectful, to hurt your parents, well, how good do you think it's going to be if you respect them? How much good do you think it's going to be if you, are, if you are good to them, if you are kind to them, if you help them out, if you speak nicely to them, if you don't mistreat them? Make it a habit to worship your parents every day before you leave home. If you're going to school, if you're going to work, whatever, it doesn't matter how old you are. It's not just kids. What about grown-ups? Have we all got parents? Why? You're worshipping Arahatun Nuhanse. What's the age limit after which you shouldn't be worshipping Arahatun Nuhanse? <laughs> What's the age limit? <laughs> what, 20? 30? So why do you put an age limit to when, you know, this is now I'm, I'm grown up. What do my parents know? I know better. My dad is old age. I'm the young age. I'm the new age. I know better. 
What does my dad know? What does my mother know? She doesn't even know how to unlock her phone. But look at me. I'm the cool guy. I'm the cool girl in town. Look at me. I, look at all the stuff that I can do. My parents, they, couldn't, they don't even know what the hell this is. But don't forget that they are Arahatun Nuhansis. To you, they are Arahatun Nuhansis. Treat them like that. With every time that you give them a glass of water, do you realize how much merit you acquire? Every time you serve them food on a plate and take to them, do you realize how much merit you acquire? Because it's got to be true both ways, right? It can't be just one way and not the other way. The Buddha's Dhamma is flawless. Because if, if it's a heinous crime to kill your mother and kill your father, then it's got to be equally beneficial, equally meritorious to be good to them. So he's put them on the same level, on the same platform. So going back to the point I was saying before, make sure you come and open up with your parents. No matter what you experience at school, at the workplace, right? Or, you know, because some of you might be doing part-time jobs. Things you experience, you have to come and open up. You know, sometimes people might threaten you. Hey, you know what we just did there? Never open your mouth up. Never say a word to this to anybody. If you do so, that'll be the end of you. They might threaten you. Make sure you go and speak to your parents. Make sure you go and find time with your mother or your father to speak up. Amma, this is what this man did to me. And he said, don't say a word about this to anybody. I feel vulnerable. What should I do now? Friends you associate with, you have to be very careful. For, with, you have to be very careful about. So, sabba papa sakarna. Killing, at all accounts, abstain from it. Don't do it on anybody's behalf. Even if your parents say, "Kill it," no, walk away. On that occasion, you don't have to treat them as arahatun nuhansis. The occasion in which they say, go do one of the unmeritorious deeds, walk away. Mother, father, I'm sorry, but I am not prepared to do that because you're prepared to serve me, but I'm going to have to eat all by myself. If you can come and help eat, then okay, we'll do it together. But no, I have to eat by myself. So I'm not prepared to suffer the consequences. If you want it, you do it, not me. Adinadana, stealing. Do not steal no matter what the consequences are, sorry, no, no matter what is there for you as a reward in return. Right? Because, you know, as you go through in life, people will encourage you to do so. I guarantee if it hasn't happened to you by now, right? Think back into your own lives now. Haven't people who you've associated with encouraged you to steal something? Hey, it's only, you know, it's something small, really small. Don't worry about it. Just take it. He won't even notice. It's all right, just, just take it. He's looking the other way, quickly. Put it in your pocket. This will happen. This will absolutely happen. If, you, if it hasn't happened in your life as yet, it will happen, certainly. And if it hasn't happened before your death, then you've been dreaming all your life, you haven't been living. This will happen in your life. And then thirdly, engaging in sensual misconduct. Now, sensual misconduct, we, we, we talk about that, you know, for those who want to attain Nibbana, which is clearly the case with all of you. But firstly, you must protect yourself. So let's limit, at least restrict ourselves to sexual misconduct on this occasion. No matter what the reward is, do not do it. Do not do it. You know, sometimes the, 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 the appeal, the lure could be so bad, it could be so strong. You could be seduced so strongly that you find it difficult to, to say no at, at, on, on that occasion. So I'm giving you practical advice, by the way. If you find yourself in such situations, and if you're regularly finding yourself in such situations, when you're, when you have, when you're in your right mind, write yourself a note. Dear, put your name next to it. Right now, I'm in my right mind. Or right now, you're in your right mind. You know, be a Satpurusha to yourself. 
write a note to yourself. When you're reading this letter, chances are you've been seduced. Chances are your mind is now defiled with raga, defiled with moha, and you're blinded with avidya and tanha. Right now you can't see right from wrong. This is why I, I, you decided to write this letter when you could see right from wrong. Do not do what it is that you feel is right to do now because that's absolutely the wrong thing to do. Stamp it in blood if you must to remind yourself that this was a solemn promise to yourself. Fold it up. Keep it in your pocket. Take a picture of it and keep it on your phone. Make it your wallpaper if you must. Put it in your book. Put it in your pencil case. Because when that opportunity arises, when it's time for society to come and engulf you, destroy you, at least there'll be a reminder. Aha, hang on. Let me, I'm going to do this anyway, but I'm going to go and read my note first. You pick up the note, you read the note. At the bottom of it says, Namo Buddha. At the end of it, it says, My father was the Lord Buddha. My ancestors were, my, my forefathers were, Sari, Sari Putta Maharatan Vahanse. My forefathers were Mughalan Maharatan Vahanse. And they went through so much to give me this human birth. This is how hard I struggled to earn this human birth. Fifty yawns I spent struggling to earn every second I am alive today. This is my solemn promise. Right now, you can't see right from wrong. Keep that in your pocket. Open it up. Read it. Read it ten times before you go and do the deed. At least that will be one obstacle to stop you from committing yourself. Practical advice. Then there will be lying. There will be harsh speech. There will be frivolous speech. You know, your mouth is probably the biggest enemy that you've got for yourself. Most of the unwholesome deeds that you do on a daily basis, on a regular basis, is because of misusing this organ that you have, that is your mouth. You don't realize you open it in all the wrong occasions. Most of the time you might as well not have said it. My Guru Swami Nuhansi says, Bhatkanna vitara katarin. And he's so, he's so right when he says that. So true. Because most of the time we open our mouths and the stuff that comes out of it, you know, stuff that you wouldn't say if you were in your right minds. Lying, backstabbing, frivolous speech which is of no use to anybody, just wasting time away, wasting 50, you know, you imagine... There's, there's a few of us here right now. You say, you know, ten, ten of us here. And there's several others on, on Skype. If I, were to, if I were to start speaking frivolous speech, that's useless speech, and, and, I, and, I, and I start to talk of speech that excites you to indulge in sensuality. This is what Samprapradapa is. Sang is avidya trushna. Pra is to continue engaging in it. Pralapa are words. Some proper lapa is, is speech that encourages indulgence in sensuality or indulgence in avidya and tanha and prolonging life in sansara. If I were to speak to you right now and speak to you about, hey, how great the heavens are, you know, you really must go and try that out. Hey, why, you know, have you seen that new movie that came out? You really must go and watch it. Best watch, you know, top movies to watch. Right? All of this is some proper lapa. You don't realize this sometimes. When you invite your friend around, hey, let's go watch the movie. I'm not saying do it or don't do it. That's totally up to you. But, you know, think about it, right? When you say that, what you are inviting them to do is indulge in what? Sensuality. Which is kame. What is kame? Ame kadana. What is ame? Nivana. So what you are doing is you are creating the environment for them to, pro to, to, to prolong sansara and procrastinate the attainment of Nibbana. Back then, Nibbana, whenever. Let's go watch that movie first. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking right now about Swami Nwaza, how can you do that? I mean, you know, 
I've got friends, I've got to go, I've got to, go to the theater, I've got to watch a movie, I've got to watch, listen to music, you know, I go to parties. Don't ask me. I can only say the truth. You've got to decide what you do with your lives. Because when it's time to eat, you've got to eat by yourself. I'm not going to be there to share with you. The more you indulge in sensuality, the more you're going to be bound to sansara. So I can only tell you the truth. It's up to you whether you choose to abide by it. You choose to live by it. That's totally up to you. So, if you want to watch movies, watch movies. If you want to go party, go party. If you want to listen to songs, music, do that. That's fine. Fine by me. Just ask yourself whether it's fine by you. That's all. If it's fine by you, no problem. By the way, I've got nothing against it. Okay, I really want to emphasize this point because I'm not here to upset you. I'm not here to make you angry or frustrate you. I really don't want you to think of me like that. Because if you do, then uh, this will probably be the last time we speak. <laughs> you know, kids will probably go and tell their parents, Mother, you know, Swami Mahasaya says, don't watch movies. What, no, how, how can we live like, 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 live like that? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, you know, every time we indulge our, sense, our senses, we are in, engaging in karma. Karma is not just sex. Karma is rupa karma, shabda karma, kanda karma, rasa karma, poddha karma. All of this is karma. Sensuality. The more you engage in sensuality, the more you're feeding your vinyane. Baby Natasha. Listen to that sermon. If not, go back and listen to it. You're feeding that baby inside of you. This self, you're feeding it. The more you feed it, the more it's going to grow. The more it's going to grow, the harder it's going to be to fight with it. When, you're, when your child was young and, and little, you know, you could shout at him, you could, if, if uh, worse come to worse, you hit him, and then he would stop doing what you said don't do. But now he's a grown up, you know, six foot tall person. How can you now hit him? Even shouting at him makes no difference, because now he's going to do what he's going to do. Like that, your baby's going to grow up. Your vinyana is going to empower the Nama Rupa. This is the Dhamma. I'm sorry, if you want to listen to the Dhamma, this is the Dhamma I'm giving you. You decide what you want to do with your lives. But just the same as you, you know, like I said, you know, I watch plenty of TV. I loved my movies. I loved watching TV. But I realized the errors in my ways. I realized how that was Abrahmacharya. This is why I entered a life of Brahmacharya. I was so pleased when, you know, Manith here the other day was, was speaking to us and he says, you know, those days I wanted to watch TV and I used to enjoy watching TV, but now, you know, the TV is there at home. I just don't feel like switching it on. What, I mean, what's the point of watching it? It's just another Rupa. There's plenty of Rupas I've taken in my life and I've got nothing at the end of it. It's, it's all that something that you do in the middle. You come in with nothing, you leave with nothing, all that stuff you do in the middle, that's all it is. And the more you do it, the longer it keeps you bound to sansara. So that's sampraprapalapa. Then there's ab, ab, then there's vyapada, abhidya and mitya drushti. Vyapada is anger. Abhidya is covetousness. In simple words, in simple English, that's where you dislike for somebody else to gain something and you want that to happen to you instead. It's not just looking at somebody and going, hey, you know, great that he got the job. It's going, hey, why did he get that job? I deserved it. It should have been mine instead. That's abhidya, covetousness. Strong in spiteful desire. Wishing for, for others not to gain and for you to gain instead. And then finally, mitya drishti. which is finding happiness through the indulgence in sensuality and, and of being of the belief that that is how happiness can be found in this world. That is Mitya Dhristi. As soon as you've moved away from that and you realize that actually all this indulgence in sensuality is only taking me to suffering every day in my life, then you enter the Noble Eightfold Path. At Sammaditi, the first step that you take on the Noble Eightfold Path. So, all of those unmeritorious deeds, whenever someone says, do it, walk away. 
Doesn't matter even if it's the Buddha that comes and says, kill that animal. Don't. Well, obviously, the Buddha's never going to say that. But I want to emphasize the point. You know, to us, there's no other being, no other person that's, that, that we revere, we respect more than the Buddha. Even if the Buddha comes and says, do the unmeritorious deeds, don't walk away. So, what is there to ask about anybody else? That's what I want to think you, what I want you to think about. So, Sabba Papa Sakarna, Kusalasa Upasampada. This is what you're doing right now. I'm really pleased to hear that you get together every Friday, is it? Yeah? Every Friday, as a group, you get together at someone's home and you listen to the Dhamma. That is Kusala. You're finding the path to, re to remove the defilements of Raga, Dvesha, Moha within you. That's what we should do. And then practice that Dhamma in the labs. What labs? The labs of life, indeed. Like I said, on your commute, to work or school in your classroom, while you're playing basketball, there's your lab. While you're painting a picture, there's your lab. While you're working on the computer, there's your lab. While you're washing yourself, there's your lab. While you're washing your clothes, while you're shaving yourself, there's your lab. While you're brushing your hair, there's your lab. While you're sweeping the house, washing your dishes, there's your lab. Changing a bulb, there's your lab. Boiling some water, there's your lab. There's really nothing that you can do that you could say, hey, doing this, I can't see how this doesn't help me attain, how this, how this helps me attain Nibbana. There really isn't anything that you could say that is of that, of that sort. So, Kusala Saupasampada, Sachitta Pariyo Dapana. Use the Dhamma to remove these defilements in your mind because it's the mind that has to be domesticated. It's the mind that has to be removed of the defilements. Because when you start doing that with your mind, and this is not just focusing your mind on anything because that you know, you can focus your mind on killing an animal. Have you, seen a, have you seen a cat walking up to catch a rat? Ever seen any more focusedness than that? Single-mindedness? Single one goal in mind? That's ekagata. That's mindfulness. A cat going after a rat. That's mindfulness. But that's not samma samadhi. That's not samma sati. Listen to previous week's sermons where we talked about the Noble Eightfold Path and how that differs, how, you know, single-mindedness single or mindfulness is different to what Samma Samadhi is. It's about removing the defilements from our minds, not focusing our minds, fixing our minds on one point. That's not what we need to do. It's removing Raga Dvesha Moha from our minds. Etam Buddhana Shasana. That is the Buddha's Anushasana. Like I said, the reason I went wrong in my life was because I did things that the Buddha said, do not do. He warned me and I didn't listen. I thought, what do you know? I know better. I'm no longer prepared to do that. Now I will only do what the Buddha said to do. Now I will only do the things that he advised I should do and I will abstain as much as I possibly can from the things that he said, do not do. If you do that, then you are safe. Because do as the Buddha did, conduct yourself as the Buddha advised to and you will not go wrong. Why? Because that advice came from whom? The perfect one. The perfect perfect one. It didn't come from me. It didn't come from your mother or your father because they're not perfect. It didn't come from your teachers because they're not perfect. It didn't come from the monk at your, at your temple because he's not perfect. It didn't even come from an Arahatun Nuhanse because an Arahatun Nuhanse is not perfect. There is only one perfect one. That's why it's, he's called the perfect one. And that's the Samma Sambuddha. Do as he said, and you will not go wrong. Never, ever. So in your associations with your, with your friends, relatives, neighbors, whoever the case may be, your colleagues, keep to that. 
You know, it's a simple thing to do. Abstain from the unmeritorious deeds. I, 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 I agree. The lure, the seduction will be so strong at some points, at some times in your life. But at that time, make sure you use the, you use the Dhamma. Use the shield of Dhamma. You know, if, 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 if you really can't help it at that time, chant Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa in your minds. You don't have to shout it out because people are going to wonder what the hell are you going on about. But chant it in your, in your minds. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. There's no force that's more powerful than the Buddha's force. There's no energy that's more powerful than the Buddha's energy. And that energy, that force, you're inviting into your hearts and minds when you chant Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. At least at that point in time when you can't fight the urge, chant it. And that will save you. But chanting alone is not going to get you anywhere. I'm all, all I'm saying is, you know, when, that, when you feel like pulling the trigger and you're just one click away from pulling that trigger on the gun, the next moment you're going to pull that trigger and that's going to fire the bullet. And that bullet is going to come out of a gun whose nose is bended the other way. So it's going to come right at you. Chant. At least do that. But the best thing to do is anicca dukkanatta. But sometimes, you know, you might not have the wisdom at that point in time. You might not have the peace of mind at that point in time to reflect on anicca dukkanatta. At least then resort. This is why we take refuge in the Buddha. You know, we're all refugees, right? What do refugees do? They go seeking asylum. When they're helpless, this is why we take refuge in the Buddha. Take refuge in the Dhamma and take refuge in the Sangha. And you won't go wrong. So, in summary, I think what I wanted to emphasize was, I mean, I understand because, you know, you're all, most of you are young people. And I know what it was like when I was your age. Now I know that sounds so patronizing. <laughs> and I know that's the lie. Yeah, you hate when people say that. I know what it's like when I was your age. <laughs> but I really don't mean any disrespect when I say that. Now, although I know what it was like when I was your age, I don't know what it is like today. Because I'm not living the worlds that you're, in li you're living in today. When I was a child and I was, I was at school, you know, I didn't go through the same experiences. Drugs and sex weren't, th weren't so prominent. You really could keep away from it if you wanted to. But nowadays, I think it's become almost impossible. At the last sermon I said, uh, the sermon that we did in, in, in this place, in five years' time, every 15-year-old will have lost their virginity, both boys and girls. Every 15-year-old. Parents, are you doing what you need to do to protect them from that? Times are ticking. Life's going on. The society's, society's deteriorating every day. Mara is playing his games. We're in the middle of the pitch. He's throwing balls from everywhere. Him and his associates. We have nowhere to run. Nowhere to hide if you don't take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. If you don't do anything else, do that. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Hold on one moment. Okay, we can hear you now. Samhansa, uh, when I came across a situation where um, uh, somebody told me that I, I tried to explain to a young child about um, having sex before marriage is wrong, mm -hmm. but uh, according to what these children in this uh, part of the world think, they think it's okay. Uh, it's okay according to this new generation, that's okay. So I couldn't uh, explain too much because they are influenced by the society. 
I like if you can give them a little bit of advice on this line, Swami Mahansa. Okay. <clears throat> See, the thing is, and I've said this in the past, um, you know, when I, was, when I was a young child, I remember my Apache used to say, My Apache used to say that to me. But the truth is that these days, <laughs> You know where I'm going with this. Puta tata da kino, tate tata herna kota mama dano tata mokata den nikino. The thing is, right, our minds, which are defiled with avidya and are constantly looking for new experiences, Vedana and Sanya, right, our minds, which are constantly looking for these things, we find satisfaction in engaging in things that have been. Forbidden. Right? Haven't we all done things that our parents said don't do? You didn't want to do them until they said don't do it. And now all of a sudden you want to do it. You know, it's that, it's that, it's that excitement that you get by doing something that has been forbidden. That's the nature of the mind. Why? You see, the reason for that is again, you go into Pelima. Your mind goes into, into pelim or suffering or affliction. This is the word I've been using of late. Look it up in the dictionary. Affliction, uh, uh, by the way, again, that's not patronizing. The reason I say that is because, you know, there are lots of meanings behind these words. And sometimes I struggle to find the right term to express these ideas. So the one I could find lately was affliction, which to some extent gives meaning, gives the meaning behind this word, right? So that wasn't a patronizing comment by any means. Please don't take it that way. I have no intention of patronizing anybody. The last person I want to patronize is you guys. The problem I, is with me, not with you. So I need to sort myself out, not you. So when someone says, don't do something, now we go into Pelima mode. Why? Because we want to know, why is it they said, don't do that? There must be something there that I, I want to go and, yeah, that, that, you know, I, sh that should be interesting. So I want to go find out. Now, to find out what that is, you do Abhisankara. And it doesn't matter sometimes, even if you have to steal, you know, you go through the unmeritorious deeds sometimes to go and find out what it was that was forbidden for you to touch, for you to look at, for you to smell, right? It doesn't matter now. You have, you have to go and find out because you want to find relief from suffering. So, the thing is, with the advancement in technology, and I don't, you know, I'm not just saying technology because, the, I mean, that seems to be a, a, a huge factor these days. We can't just point our finger at technology all the time, but it seems to be a, big, a huge factor these days. As you say, the older generation can't keep up with the younger generation. The younger generation is much further ahead in, when it comes to technology and keeping up and abreast with technology than the, the, young, the newer generation, or the, rather the older generation. So, when you say don't do something, chances are they're going to find a way under your noses to go and do it anyway. So, don't do something is not going to be the answer to the solution, so, or rather the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem, as I said, is the Dhamma, is to help them understand when you, when you engage in whatever sensual indulgence, that could be, you know, what, like as, as I said, the, the karma is pancha karma, rupa shabda gandha rasa sparsha, and we, you know, right now we're talking about the sparsha karma, sex, right, premarital sex. So, when we, when we talk about that subject, what really children should be made aware of is, what's really there to be gained in having it? This thing that you experience, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you... Um, what are, you know, this we, we touched on briefly at today's sermon. You know, if you, if, for example, because ultimately, you know, when, when you, when you in, indulge in, in seeking that pleasure, you're seeking, you're seeking pleasure in, in, in the patterns that you feel. That bodily sensation is experienced 
in the change in, in, in or the variation in, in feelings, in sensations. So like I said, you know, when, for example, you know, you, you were to, if you were to touch your palm like this, that, you know, that's just, that's just a stimulus. That's just another stimulus. That doesn't bring you pleasure of any particular kind. But if you rub, if you were to rub yourself, now that's more pleasurable. But if you were to break this, this process down, if you were to analyze what's really going on here, all you're doing is touching here, lifting your finger, touching the next bit, lifting your finger, touching the next bit, lifting your finger up, touching the next bit. Yes, you're not literally lifting your finger, but actually if you, if you took a, a microscope and looked at your skin on, you know, under the microscope, what you're gonna, you're, you're gonna see are receptors. They're individual receptors. So while you're not lifting your finger up literally, what you're experiencing is stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. Sensations. But because you're giving it pattern by rubbing yourself like this, that's, that feels pleasurable. Now, ultimately all you're feeling is touch, no touch, touch, no touch, touch, no touch, and touch, no touch. Or stimulus, no stimulus, no stimulus, no stimulus, and so on. It's just alternating stimuli. That's all you're, that's all you're sensing. But the pattern you experience, not outside, the pattern you create in your own mind, just the same as when you listen to, listen to a song, you know, who creates the song? Your, your ears can't listen to a song. Absolutely not. Your ears, can only, your ears are only sensitive to sound waves. They're sensitive to frequencies. Your ears aren't sensitive to songs or music. It's just sensitive to, to sound waves and individual notes. You know, this is why when you write music, you can write the individual mo notes that make up the song, right? So your, your ears can only pick up individual notes that have distinct frequencies. But what your mind does is it's, it's capable of taking all those notes together and then producing a song in its stead. And the same goes for sexual pleasure. Because what you're ultimately experiencing is pleasure that you've created in your own mind. It does not exist in the outside world. So that's one aspect of it. What are the other aspects of it? <laughs> Remember, no pain, no gain. So if you are feeling gain right now, well, you are in pain beforehand. You are in suffering beforehand. You are yearning for it. That, that frustration you are now relieving through indulgence. That's the other aspect. There's an even other aspect. You know, think about all the pain that you're experiencing in life right now. All the headaches, all the back aches, all the stomach aches, the growing old, the can't go to the toilet when you want to, the going to the toilet when you don't want to, right? All of that. All of that is the result of having been born. And having been born is the result of bhava. Bhava is the result of upadana. Upadana is the result of Tanha, which is attachment. And finally, what, even without you realizing what you're doing is, you're producing, you're, you're producing seeds which are going to be planted at the end of your birth, at, at the end of this life, to bring you another life. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have to go through all that pain all over again. Why? Because you're doing this karma. And also, you know, so here's another thing that, especially, particularly young, you know, because it's young people who usually find, you know, find themselves in these situations. A guy gets married to somebody, or you know, he finds himself a partner. Even after getting married, right? And you can, you can speak to your parents and, and ask them if this is not the case, right? A guy gets married to a woman, before marriage, they think, hey, you know, this is the perfect person for me. She's going to make me the happiest man alive. And of course, vice versa. Right? And then they start living together. Now, living under one roof, they're living apparently a happy married life. But still, this guy walks on the street. He goes for a jog. He sees a girl jogging alongside on the other path. He turns his head to have a quick look. A quick glance. A furtive glance. Why so? Well, did you not just bring her home, the other woman home, thinking that she was going to be the perfect person? There's no better person. 
the problem is there is never a perfect person. Because there is never somebody that fits exactly to your model. This model that you've built inside your mind. This model that you've created for yourself. This is why you're always looking. Yes, I've got one for myself, but what about the other ones? Surely there must be one more that can tick one more box. You're always looking. Actually, you know what? I changed my, I take by what I said. Don't go and ask your parents about that. Wait until you experience it for yourself. Because it's probably going to be embarrassing for your parents to admit to it. But you will experience this. You know, when you walk on the street, right? A couple walking together. You know, observe, observe. Because through observing the world, you can learn a lot about the world. Then you don't have to make the same mistakes. You can learn from other people's mistakes. That's the best way to learn. Observe a couple walking along the street. And if they're not wearing sunglasses so they can hide their furtive glances, you know, look at where they're looking. Holding hands, the couple. But another girl, another girl walks past. Where's the man looking at now? A quick glance, just a quick furtive glance. Or where the, where's, where's the woman looking at? A hunky bloke walks past. Oh, a quick glance. Why? You're always looking. So you're never entirely satisfied with what you have. Why is that? Because the world can't make you happy. You've got these models that you're constantly trying to fit the world into. It's never going to happen. Why? Because it was your vinyana, the magician, the wizard that created this world for you. Forever you keep for as long as you keep looking for a world that fits entirely, exactly into your model, you're always going to be in frustration. You're always going to be in pelima. So, would you rather go looking for relief from suffering or go looking for redemption from suffering? Indulgence in sensuality is never going to solve the problem. Well, guess what? What do you think you did in your previous births? <laughs> indulgence in sensuality every single birth why do you think you're still alive why do you think you came into this world indulgence in sensuality if you understand that there's a real there's a serious problem here you know this is what this is what indriya sangware is when you want to, when you when you feel like i have to look how i'm dying to look Take that moment to reflect on Anichadukananta. What is it that I'm looking at? How many billions, if not trillions of sites, infinite site, number of sites I've looked, by, looked at by this point in my life? None of them ever fully satisfied me. Why do I think that looking at this is going to make me happy? How many women might I have slept with by now in the constant journey, in my endless journey in Sansara? Am I still satisfied? How many men might I, might I have slept with by now in this endless journey in sansara? Am I still satisfied? No. You know, the kings in those days, they had what they called the antapure. I haven't quite found a word for it yet. I'm sure there must be a word. If you know, do you know a word for the antapure? Okay. So the antapure, I'll, I'll find the English word for it. If you know it, you can, you can let me know. So in the time of the kings, what they used to do is they, you know, any, any pretty woman, any beautiful woman that they found in their, in their kingdom, they, they wanted to make them, they wanted to make the girl his. Or he wanted to make, make, make her his wife. So bigamy was permitted. It, was actually, it wasn't even bigamy, it was polygamy. Polygamy was permitted for kings. So the Antapure was where all of the kings queens not the chief queen but all her all his mistresses used to come and live that was what the antapure is sometimes in in several hundreds 200 300 400 500 women this is what you know life for the kings was like anyone want to be a king <laughs> But you see, the, what you need to take from this is 500 didn't make him happy. One didn't make him happy, so he went looking for a second. 
Two didn't make him happy, so he went looking for a third. Three didn't make him happy, so he went looking for a fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the tenth, the sixtieth, the seventieth, the hundred, the two hundred, the three hundred, the five hundred, and he's still not satisfied. This indulgence in sensuality is never going to fulfill us. This is why it's called the kame. It puts you from the coal into the fire. In wanting to indulge in sensuality, what we do is we, en we engage in unmeritorious deeds. And now, because it's, I, I really have to leave by 10, we've got 15 minutes. I'll share this story with you. There are some pretas, spirits, in the preta worlds, who've been born as pretas because of having sought pleasure, in sexuality or mis misappropriated in sexuality so having broken the third precept engaging in sexual misconduct some praetors who are born and I'll describe to you what they're like they're naked festering wounds all over their bodies Balls the size of cement bags and, 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 and weighing as, as much as cement bags. Right? If you ever weighed a cement bag, it's about 50 kilos. I'm talking about testes. And they have to carry it on their backs when they walk around. And they've been infested with worms. These are the consequences of engaging in sexual misconduct. And so whenever they, they have to move around, they have to pick these balls up, put them on their back, and then walk around. All the other praetors that, that can see them, they, they, start, they throw stones at him. You sickening little thing, how could you? They insult him, hit him, and, and hurt him. And all the while, his body is, is infested with worms. These balls are infested with worms. That's the suffering that they have to endure. That's for men. What about women? They are also born in the Preta worlds. This is again engaging in sexual misconduct, which is premarital sex. Women born with sexual organs many meters wide again infested with worms and they have to walk around like this naked and with people sorry or rather other spirits Cursing at them, ridiculing them, throwing stones at them. This is what the Preta world is like. And these are the consequences if you engage in sexual misconduct. Now, while engaging in the deed might be pleasurable, ask yourself, are you prepared to suffer the consequences? If you are, Go ahead and do it. If you are not, run a million miles. When the opportunity arises, walk away. Take that sheet of paper that I asked you to put in your pockets. Unfold it. Read it. Read it ten times if you must. Because, you know, that urge when there are hormones running all over your body, it's going to be difficult to overcome it. But don't give in. Because if you give in, guess who has to suffer the consequences? You're going to have to suffer the consequences. All by yourself. Remember Kosala Mallika? I'll end with that story. Kosala Mallika was the king of the king Kosala. They were a very rich, well-to-do dynasty. And Kosala Mallika 
she was she is renowned for having given the asadrushadane to the buddha and his disciples and the mahasangha 500 arahatu nuhanses 500 arahatu nuhanses and the buddha preceded this ceremony this function so he was called the asadrushadane because there's no dane there's no arms that was more superior to this dane it has never been seen or heard of a dane like this ever before that's why it's called the asadrushadane there's every buddha is only able to receive one asadrushadane and gautama samma sandrujanan mahanse received the asadrushadane from kosala mallika when kosala mallika died uh, i'll tell you how much she spent on that on offering that she spent 14 crores how much is that in million 14 million uh, a lakh is a hundred thousand so uh, a million 10 million 14 million she spent on offering and preparing that dane now you might think hang on 14 million i could get a loan out for that <laughs> this is 2500 years ago 14 million 2500 years ago how much money do you think that is now there's probably not enough money in this country to make up 14 million in today's currency that much money she spent on preparing and offering this dane to the to the to the to the lord buddha and the and the arahatu nuances however even having done so at the moment of her death she was reminded of a time when she had engaged in sexual misconduct and she was born into the apayas what a pity what a pity to have been able to offer the asadrushadane and still have been born into the apayas so be very very careful because unless you become a sotapanna because once you become a sotapanna your thoughts are not going to be inclined towards the dasagusala when even when the opportunity arises see parents this is what i have to say in response to your question give your give your children the insurance that i speak of help them to become sotapannas because once they become sotapannas now you don't have to always keep eye you don't have to keep watch why because they have the dhamma to keep watch it's like you've got a babysitter 24 7. the dhamma is going to be the babysitter constantly keeping an eye out for your children no matter what age they are so give them the gift of dhamma as soon as you become as, as soon as you are guaranteed that your child is a sotapanna dear mother you don't have to worry about that problem anymore make sure you give them that gift but like i say threatening them i don't think these days is going to solve the problem it used to in my time my dad could threaten me and get all sorts of things done but i doubt in this day and age that's going to be possible so i can't give you advice which i doubt is practical so which i doubt is which i doubt is practical so i have to give you practical advice this is why i say give them the gift of dhamma explain to them what the consequences are in engaging in sexual misconduct and also explain to them why this is a useless thing to do essenceless meaningless ultimately all you've done is karma which for which you have to pay vipakas for nothing else has been gained and that pleasure that you've experienced in doing the deed you've only created in your own mind it never existed in the outside world this is nothing other than self-gratification and in going forth to engage in self-gratification you put through yourself through what self-mortification this is what we spend our time in all sentient beings spend their time either in self-gratification or when you're suffering the consequences of of the deeds you've done for self-gratification in self-mortification isn't it time to step out of that circle it's a vicious circle step outside of it Nibbana is the only salvation. May all beings in all worlds attain Nibbana. Any more questions? 
I think even if you do, I'll probably have to end it there. Okay. Remember, it's, there's nothing special about me. All I am is a vehicle for the Dhamma. It's the Buddha who's the proprietor. He is our master. I'm nobody. It's the Dhamma that is our teacher. And it's the Ari Maha Sangha who we must always use as exemplary. I'm still trying to be at least a modicum of what Sariputta Maharatan Vahanse was. I'm, I'm nowhere near. So there's nothing special about me really. And like I said last week, uh, last time we had this sermon, you know, I think really it's you as parents who deserve praise for what you've done today. You know, you've taken the trouble to organize all of this and also uh, all of you here as well. You've, you've arranged all of this. You've made this venue available to us. All I had to do is turn up. I didn't even have to drive the car. <laughs> all I had to do was get in, get out, come and sit here and start speaking. And listen to my own voice, which is quite becoming quite un uncomfortable. But I've been listening to it for several hours today. Um, but like I say, you know, it's you that deserve praise. And the parents that you are and how much you go through to give your children this gift of Dhamma. And it's, it's through your hard efforts, through your pain, that you know, we are fortunate enough to have two of your own children here with us today, Manith and his brother. Sure, your reputation precedes you. Okay? So, you know, it's, it's, it's thanks to your efforts. I mean, you know, they, they, they speak volumes of how, you know, you take the trouble to, to organize these sermons and get together on a Friday afternoon or evening even and, and, and discuss the Dhamma, right? So it's, it's you guys that, that, that that's the success behind all of this. So well done, all of you. So before we conclude, let us transfer the merits that we have all acquired to all those who deserve these merits, and then we shall conclude there. <coughs> <coughs> First and foremost, let us take a moment again to reflect on the fact that it is because of the peerless one, the perfect one, the infinitely compassionate Supreme Buddha that we have, the Dhamma today. It is through his dedication, through his commitment, through his infinite sacrifice for the benefit of all sentient beings that the Dhamma arose in his mind and through infinite compassion that he preached the Dhamma for the benefit of all sentient beings. And it's the Bhikkhu Bhikkhunis and the Upasika Upasikas who protected and preserved his Dhamma in the form of the Tripitaka and passed it down through generation to generation all the way down to us. And today we have the, that gift of Dhamma to practice, to analyze, to reflect on and to help us all redeem from the shackles of Sansara. So may the merits that we have all acquired today be transferred to the Bhikkhu Bhikkhunis Upasika Upasikas who lived all the way from the time of the from the time of the supreme buddha all the way up until today and you know this day and, and and this age may they all rejoice in these merits if any of them have been born in the woeful plane may these merits help them be born in the blissful plane and may these merits help them refrain from the unmeritorious deeds fulfill the meritorious deeds and attain the supreme bliss of nibbana sadhu 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 and also take a moment to transfer the merits that we have all acquired today to all bhikkhu bhikkhunis upasika upasikas the aryas who strive day and night to fulfill this journey, to fulfill the, the, the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha's teaching, and also in their path to do so, in, in, their, in, their, in their quest to do so, to not only redeem themselves from the shackles of sansara, also disseminate this Dhamma for the benefit of all sentient beings. May they all rejoice in the maze that we have all acquired today, and may these maids help them attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana in this very birth itself, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Also for a moment, take a, ta also for a moment, take a moment to reflect, take a moment to transfer the, all the merits that we have all acquired today to the Mahanayaka Swami Mahansas, the Anunayaka Swami Mahansas, as well as the monks who are resident in your local towns and villages, wherever in the world you may be. It doesn't matter who they are, it doesn't matter where they've come from. It is thanks to them that you have found a solid 
you have you have been able you have been given a solid foundation in the dhamma it is thanks to them that you have had the opportunity to go to dham parcel so it's not i that have done any of that it's the swami nuances who live and work hard who've left their motherland to come and be where you are today to give you the gift of dhamma so may all the merits that we have all acquired today help them all fulfill the path that they are, that they strive to do and help them attain the supreme bliss of nibbana in the very birth itself sadhu 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 also let us take a moment to transfer the merits to all the deva spirits demons that we have and and brahmas that we invited to join with us today to be with us today as well as anyone who's been a mother father a brother sister uncle aunt and anyone who's been a relation of any way in in any way shape or form to you in your endless and endless journey in sansara may all the, may all of them rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today may they may these merits help them refrain from the unmeritorious deeds may these merits help them fulfill the meritorious deeds and attain the supreme bliss of nibbana sadhu 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 and also let us take a moment to transfer the merits that we have all acquired today to those who took the the efforts made the efforts and took the took the pain to organize this sermon today who opened up their homes for us to be present here today who've given us the the privilege of being here by by offering us the facilities that we've made use to deliver this sermon and to also disseminate this sermon to stream this sermon live for the benefit of people who live outside of this country may they all also rejoice in this merits and anyone who might have invited you who might have offered you a glass of water who might have offered you a seat or who might have just made it made made available a comfortable environment for you to sit down and listen to this sermon may all of them rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today may these merits help them refrain from the merit from the unmeritorious deeds fulfill the meritorious deeds and attain the supreme bliss of nibbana in this very birth itself sadhu 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 and finally may all the merits that we have all acquired today empower all those aryas all those bikku bikkuni supasa kupasikas everyone just like each and every one of your each and every one like yourselves to fulfill the path of nibbana and may us be able to witness through yourself through yourselves many hundreds of thousands of arahatun wahan says in this blessed land very soon sadhu 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 and finally may the merits that we have all acquired today in preaching this sermon in listening to this sermon and making this sermon possible and available in any way shape or form rejoice in these meritorious deeds and be able to fulfill nibbana in the era of the gautama samma samrujana and vahanse itself and in this very human birth itself sadhu 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 may the noble triple gem be with you all maha sangrat nevising mettani sanse mettani sanse aashirwada karana bala prithuna sila dana vandana karaganna raga ginnen midetnwa द्वेश मोह गिन्वान परम सुखयन सुखित तार निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार मम दियलु लोक सियलु सत्वयो निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार तुंडवान गे सुविशी अनंत महागुण बेलेन सीलु लोक सीलु सत्योम निभान परम सुखेन सुखित तार वेत्वा साधु साधु साधु